tell us where he, he professes. Uh, Bwana Sifiwe. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. Bwana Sifiwe again. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bishop Kimani, for opening your pulpit once again for me to uh, come and, uh, and minister. Uh, Reverend Wamboy and I have been wonderful friends of Deliverance Church, Zimmerman. For many years, we started being part of this church from when it was very young. And I do appreciate the opportunity every time I get uh, to come to Kenya. Uh, Bishop Kemani has always extended uh, an open door for me to come and share the word of the Lord with you. For the last four years that I've been coming to US, I've had a chance uh, to come and fellowship here uh, and to come and minister in the world. I gotta tell you, you have the best church in Kenya. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and and I, I was so blessed, especially this morning when uh, Bishop Kimani told me that this is an African service and I came in the middle of singing and praising and I'm telling you, this is powerful. Yeah. Hallelujah. And, and what a blessing it is. Um, and as uh, Bishop Kimani uh, told you, my wife and I live in Tifton, Georgia. And uh, I serve with, uh, with several ministries. One of the ministries we serve with is called the Kenya Christian Fellowship in America. I served as its national president for many years. I continue to serve as the, the chairman of the board of trustees. And uh, we minister a lot in different areas. And I, I'm just excited as you remember that you, you brought me two drums. And uh, some of you may be wondering, you know, why uh, did I request Bishop Kimani to bring me to African drums to America? And you may not know, I was a Mokorino. <laughs> and, I, and man, I like to beat that drum, embracing God. And I figured, although I went to the university, got all the education, and, and I was preaching in white churches, uh, I'm just going to keep my, my ocorino, because that was a good beginning. Yeah. And, and then I'm telling you, Bishop Kiman, we've been beating those drums in every church where we go to preach, yeah. uh, in American churches, and they get blessed. And when we, my wife and I start beating and dancing, and we sing Kikuyu song for them. <laughs> And we tell them, when you came as missionaries a long time ago in Kenya, you came as speaking to us your language, and some of us in the village, we didn't know it. And so we're going to sing for you in our language. And they love it. They actually stand up, clap, and start dancing with us. So, um, so, so and for profession, what I do, uh, I'm a professor uh, at Abram Baldwin State College, which is part of the University of Georgia. Uh, and I really praise God for everything that he has uh, given me and used me in, in terms of recently we started a new ministry to campus in the U.S. called Marriage Dynamics, uh, uh, Marriage for, uh, for National Forum, because our, our marriages in the U.S. have really faced a lot of challenges. And so we are holding seminars, uh, teaching couples how to build a better relationship with one another throughout the United States. Now, if you have your Bible, I would like to share with you uh, from the word of the law. And, uh, you know, this year I've been praying and, and asking the Lord, you know, what are you doing in the church? What are you saying uh, to us? Uh, and as I've seen, the challenges facing us as Church of Jesus Christ and the, cha the challenges facing the society, I just felt that the Lord is saying to us, it is time to get a double of his anointing and power. Amen. When you face a great opposition, when you face a great enemy, when you face a great challenge in your life. 
then in order for you to be able to defeat that enemy, to overcome that challenge, you have to have power or ability or skills greater than those of your enemy. And we are living in an age, in a time and in a society where the enemies of our spiritual lives, the enemies of the church, the challenges in the world, Satan has ensured that he has lifted up a standard and whose aim, as the Bible says, to kill and to destroy and to hinder the people of God. But the good news is that God Almighty is in control and he desires to release more than ever before. that we have ever experienced before so that when we face the challenges of our time and the challenges of this generation that the competition will not be a draw we will totally win, overcome, destroy, obliterate and come out on top as winners because we know that is our destiny as the people of God Amen, Amen. Amen. So I really believe it's time for a double portion and as I was praying now, do we have a scripture in the Bible that talks about a double portion? If I want to get a double portion of the power of the Spirit, double portion of the blessings, double portion upon my children, and double portion of money, and there are some people sitting here that could use a double portion right. of something. Right. Amen? Amen? It may be the money that you have is not enough to meet all your needs and pay all your debts. Maybe you need a double portion in your money. I am excited about the vision of this church, Bishop Kimani, building these wonderful you know, facilities for the kingdom of God. It looks like it is time for a double portion for the church. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And as I was thinking, where is the double portion? The Lord led me to 2 Kings uh, chapter 2. And there we see a story. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 2, and verse number 9, this is the story of Elisha and Elijah. And, and let's begin uh, from verse number 9. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. I'll repeat that again. That this was Elisha's prayer. He said, I desire one thing and I pray one thing. That let a double portion of thy spirit, everyone in the church of the Lord say a double portion. If God today what to ask you, my daughter, my son, what can I do for you? If you were to pray today, what would you ask of the Lord? When Elijah asked Elisha, what would you ask of me today? Elisha said that what I have desired, it is to receive a double portion of your spirit, or double portion of your anointing upon me. Verse number 10. And he said, Thou have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to thank you because of such an anointing and power that is upon this service. We thank you because of the freedom and the spirit of liberty. We thank you that you are moving in our midst, touching our lives and touching our needs. I pray, Father, that you continue to open our hearts and our thoughts and our minds to hear the word of the Lord. I pray that, Lord, as I teach and preach the word of the Lord, that, God, you will open our minds to receive a revelation knowledge, to speak to us, to, at the point where we are, so that we can grow to a higher level. I pray that in the name of Jesus, the Lord, that you anoint the word, 
and that the word I preach will come directly from the mind of Christ. And that word will touch the lives of your people this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. So, the title of my message this morning is, The Road to Receiving a Double Portion. The Road to Receiving a Double Portion. When Elisha said to Elijah that what I want to receive is a double portion of your anointing and your power, the first thing Elijah said to Elisha, you have asked, you have prayed for, you have requested for a hard thing. Now I want you to understand that if you are going to pray for something from God, don't always pray for the easy thing. Don't always ask for the simplest thing. Because God has promised in his word that when we pray according to his will, he will hear our prayers and he will do it for us. Amen. And if God has promised to stand by his word, then if we're going to ask something, ask the hard thing. Amen? Amen? And the reason Elijah said to Elisha, you have asked for a hard thing, think for a moment who Elijah was. What type of a prophet he was. And here <laughs> is Elisha who has the audacity to think he did not only want the same level of anointing that was upon Elijah. You know, that could have been one thing. He said, Father, just give me the same level of anointing that was operating in you. And I'm telling you, that would have been a big anointing. Wasn't it a big anointing? No, no, no. Elijah had the audacity and the guts to say, eh, Elijah, I want to be bigger than you. I want to be more than you. I want more than you had. Wow. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the nation of Israel. There were two prophets, historically, that occupied the highest place of honor in the nation of Israel. The first one was Moses, who was the greatest prophet that ever lived. So, following Moses, the next greatest prophet in Israel was Elijah. And there were a lot of parallels between the between the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Elijah. God raised them under different circumstances during a time of greatest challenge and need in the light and the society of Israel. When God raised Moses, the children of Israel were, were under bondage and they needed to be set free. When God raised Elijah, the nation of Israel was under apostasy. It was lost. They had started worshipping idols. Instead of worshipping the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, they had turned to another God called Baal. They, were, they, they had introduced, because King Ahab had married a strange woman by the name of Jezebel, she had seduced the nation of Israel to start to worship idols to worship Babel. Now, Elijah had to have a such high level of anointing to be able to come against this great apostasy in the nation, to come against the evil that, that had befallen, the seduction of the spirit of Baal that had come upon the society. So he needed a high anointing and power that was commensurate and more higher than the power of the spirit of Jezebel in the society. And God anointed him. And we all remember the, uh, the number and the total miracles that Elijah performed. Even, remember Mount Carmel, where he was confronted by the prophets of Baal. And, and, he had, and at one time he had called upon heaven and fire to come down to burn all of them. He was anointed. And think, Elijah is saying, I want a double portion of that. You, you know that stuff that you did all those miracles? Elijah raised the dead. And Elijah is saying, I want a double portion of that. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. That is why 
He said, Elijah said to Elisha, you have prayed for a hard thing. But you know, with God, all things are possible. Yes. With God, there is always a nevertheless. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, you have prayed, you have asked for a hard thing. But nevertheless. And he gave him a condition. You see, for every promise of God, there is always a condition. There is our part, something we have to walk through. There is something we are called upon to do so that we can be able to partake of God's destiny and so that we can be able to receive what God has for us. He said, if you see me live, that was the condition, then you shall receive an answer to your prayer. So let me go back a little bit and walk with you through the journey to a double portion. Before they got into this place of a, of a double portion, they went through four cities. They went through four cities. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 2, and verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a wheel wind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, I want everyone to note that their journey together started at a place called Gilgal. So everybody say Gilgal. Gilgal. So Gilgal is stage one, or the first, the first level. And you need to understand this. Everything that happens in our spiritual lives, there is a purpose to it. Everything that God allows to happen to us in our lives, there is a purpose to it. And we have seasons, and we have stages in our spiritual lives. And before we can get to a place of receiving a double portion of God's anointing or blessings, we have to go through certain seasons in our lives. And the key here, it was for Elisha to understand the season that he was in. And, and the key for you and I, it is to discern the season we are in, in our spiritual lives, so that we know what do we need to go through so that we can partake or receive of a double portion of God's anointing and blessings in our lives. So the beginning level was Gilgal. Verse 2, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. So the next city they went to is called Bethel. Everybody say Bethel. Yes. I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Verse number 3. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And I'll make a note of that. That every time Elijah is moving from one stage to the next stage, from city to city, he would tell Elisha, tarry here, stay here. And Elisha, he, Elisha would say, oh no, man of God, servant of God, I'm not going to tarry here. I'm coming with you. And, and, when, and when Elisha made up his mind that he's going to follow the man of God, the servant of God, the prophet of God, there were those around the prophet who told him, no, don't go. For example, there were 50 prophets at every city. And the 50 prophets were trying to stop him from following Elijah. So verse 4, and Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. Everybody say Jericho. Yeah. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and, thy, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said, And he knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. Verse number 6, and Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. Everybody say Jordan. Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, 
And as, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they both went on. Uh, verse number 8. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together when they came to the river Jordan. And smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. Now, they were before they could come to a place where Elisha was going to walk into the promises of God, where he was going to receive a mantle from Elijah, they had to go through four seasons, four conditions, four, 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 four cities. And today, I want to talk about these four cities. The first one is Gilgal, which is a season of our spiritual lives. Number one is Gilgal. Gilgal is a place of change. It is a place of surrender. It is a place of moving forward. It is a place of starting a journey to follow God or to follow your destiny. Number two is the city of Bethel. Bethel is a season or a stage of a prayer. It is a place of searching and seeking God. A door to heaven, the house of God, a place where miracles commence and start. Stage number three, Jericho. In your spiritual life, when you arrive at a place called Jericho, the season of Jericho is different from the season of Bethel. It is different from the season of Gilgal. And, and I want you to make a note, you cannot get to Jericho until you start from Gilgal, and you cannot get to Jericho until you go through Bethel. Because Jericho is a place of activation. Jericho is a place of shout. It's a place of victory. It is a place where Joshua and the children of Israel saw the walls of Jericho collapse. They saw their enemies defeated and they saw victory in their hand. And finally, number four, it is Jordan. Jordan is a place of impartation where Jesus was baptized by John where he saw the Holy Spirit descend from heaven. It was a place of anointing where he crossed over into his public ministry to change the world and to change the destiny of humanity. It is a place where Elijah was going to receive the mantle through which he would partake of a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. So let's talk about this uh, for a moment. Let's start with Gilgal. Before you partake, and you receive a, the mantle, you receive a double portion of God's blessings, you have to start at Gilgal. It's a place of surrender. It is a place of starting a process. It's a place where you discern the seasons of God in your life. Elijah and Elisha started their journey together at Gilgal. Gilgal is not a place of double portion. It is not where you experience God's double anointing and power. However, it is a place where you start a journey to go to a place where you're going to receive a double portion of God's blessings in your life. Because before you get to that place, you have to start here at Gilgal. Had Elisha opted to tarry too long in Gilgal, he would have missed his opportunity for a double portion. And I said to you this morning, discern the seasons of God in your life. I ask you today, are you in the season where you are supposed to be? Where you are right now, have you lingered there too long? Is it time to move to the next season in your spiritual journey? I ask you to pray that the Holy Spirit will give you a revelation regarding the seasons of your life. Where are you in the seasons, seasons of your life? Where is your marriage in the seasons of your life? Where are your finances and your professional life in the seasons of your life? Did you know it is possible to be at the right place but stay there too long? See only well. You can actually be at the right place and it was the right season for the right time, but you can stay there too long. And I'm asking you in, in the house that you have now, have you stayed there too long? Is it a time to buy another house? The neighborhood where you are staying now, have you stayed there too long? Is it time to move to another neighborhood? The business that you own now, have you owned it too long? Is it time to double your business and move to another business? Amen? The place where you are, the season in your life where you are, 
Had you learned that they are too long, is it time to move to the next season in your life? Because believers miss God's blessings because sometimes you arrive at a season in your life, you start enjoying it, it becomes easier to stay there, to enjoy that level. Because you see, moving to, the high, to a higher level requires greater sacrifice. It calls for a greater level of reaching deep to, to give more than you are giving now. And as human beings, sometimes we like comfort. And we enjoy our comfort zone when we are being told, my daughter, my son, it's time to get out of that boat. Get in the water. Jump like Peter. And start walking by faith. And move into your destiny. Move into the next season in your life. I want you to pray and seek the Lord today. Find out in the seasons of your life whether you have stayed where you are too long. I study the story of the children of Israel. Did you know that they remained in Egypt for 400 years? <laughs> and I always wonder, when they first went to Egypt, they were not slaves. Egypt, in fact, was a good place. In fact, they were so favored when God lifted, lifted up Joseph and he became the prime minister of the land. He had the favor of God from Pharaoh himself. And the children of Israel were given the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen was the most fertile and the most prosperous and green. And they prospered. And they multiplied. And they increased. And they grew, by the Bible says. You know, I always wonder, when the good Pharaoh died, who favored the children of Israel, who knew Joseph, and when Joseph died, what would have happened if they said, hey, we have lived in Egypt long enough. Let us get out. They would have avoided becoming slaves. And am I telling the truth? They would have never become slaves. They would have left Egypt with a lot of prosperity. They would have gone with their, their dignity and their children would have never known what it is to be slaves and Egyptians. But sometimes I think they tarried in Goshen too long. They lingered too long. And the season of God came to an end. And when the season of God came to an end, the spirit of slavery came upon them and enslaved them. I'm telling you today, church, if you linger in that season too long, your time of blessings will come to an end. And the spirit of slavery will come upon you. And you may start suffering, and you will not know why you are suffering. But I have good news for you. Amen. Our God is a God of second chance. Yes. Amen? Amen? That even if we make bad choices in our lives, and we make mistakes, and, and, and we fail to discern the right seasons and the way God is moving in our life, God is a God of second chance. The Bible says that God heard the cry and the prayers and the agony and the suffering of the children of Israel and God raised a deliverer. Amen? Amen. That if they if they did not discern their season, that it was time to move when God moves, God still came through for them. God sent a deliverer. And I'm saying to you, even if you have lingered in that season too long, God can still send you a deliverer. But as soon as you discern that it is time to move, you better move with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here in Gilgal, God was starting to do a new thing in Elisha's life. He was starting to move him into God's destiny. And I want you to think about this for a time. The choices and the decisions we have made in our life determine who we are today and where we are today. And this moment that we have is so supremely important because the past is gone. It's no longer exists. It's, it's gone. It's no longer with us. Yesterday is gone. Last week is gone. Last year is gone. What we have now is this very time and this moment where you and I right now are existing. The future is yet to come. 
We have not lived in our future yet. We are waiting it to come. Our tomorrow has not come. So we are in this unique moment. A moment that we call now. A moment we call Leo. Our Sasa. This is a unique moment. When God demands a change, he does not tell you to change in the past. There is no way that you and I can go into the past and fix any mistake that we ever made. It's impossible. We cannot go into the future. We can only operate and make choices right now, this moment. God has given us this moment because it is supreme and important. Right now you can make a decision and a choice that could change your destiny, that could transform your future. So there is always a chance, so long as you and I, we have a moment called now. Hallelujah. So long as you are alive. So long as you are alive, there is hope. So long as you are alive, there is hope. I don't care what you have gone through, the hardships you've suffered, the struggles you had had to overcome in order to get to this moment. But I'm saying to you, so long as you're alive, there is hope. Amen. Hallelujah. You can make a decision today. Yes. You can make a choice today yes. that could transform your future. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So the moment today, how did we get here? We arrived here through personal history. And I gotta tell you, everybody has a history. Right. <laughs> Even the people you see very successful, more successful than you, those people have a history. <laughs> the people who are lower than you, they have a history. You have a history. I have a history. Your history may be different from my history. Amen? But to the truth of the matter, we have arrived at this moment through choices and the decisions we made in our history in the past. The past give context to this moment and to this reality that we are seeing now. We live in a society in an age where we tend to blame others. If something goes wrong in your life, you want to blame another person. And, uh, we live in American society and, and American society is horrible for blame, blaming one another. In fact, the people who engage in, in, in criminal activities when they go to court, they say, no, it's not my fault. It is the environment in which I was raised in. Well, it's my mom and dad did not take very good care of me. <laughs> That's why I made those mistakes. Uh, people run. If something happens and they want to blame the other person, people don't like to take responsibility for their lives. God has created us as individuals. He has a personal destiny for he, for you and for me. We have 7 billion people on this planet. And there is no person in the world that is exactly like you. <laughs> Come on, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Can you imagine? God has created 7 billion human beings. And there is none that is like Dr. Jerome. Am I unique and different? <laughs> I don't know whether I would want to meet another Jerome. <laughs> I've met people who look like me a little bit. But not exactly like me. To imagine that I'm so unique, so different in everything. God has created me for a purpose and for a reason. He is a marvelous God. And I want you to know that he created you for a reason. And you have a, you, you have a, you have a destiny and a purpose in this life. And in discovering your season for this moment, you can make a choice and a decision that will bring you to a place where you fulfill your purpose. Nobody was created for nothing. Otherwise, God would have never made you. Took up a model. It, man, it excites me. To know, oh, hallelujah. I, I'm not in this life by an accident. Yes, I, I was born in Mogoga. Actually, Mogoga is the next place. I, I, it's not that I, I didn't choose to be born in Mogoga. God chose for me to be born in Mogoga. And my parents made many choices for me. Then they moved me to the Rift Valley. That's where I grew up. Then they moved me to Loitoto. 
and, and, and these different places. And, and eventually I got to a place where I could be able to make my own decisions and my choices. And eventually I made a choice to go to America. Through all this, the one thing I know is that God created me unique and special for a purpose. He knows me and I have to find my purpose in my life. And I, whoa, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, God cannot make a mistake. He never made a mistake, mistake when he made you. Never allow anybody to put you down. Crush your spirit or derail your vision or your dream. Never allow another human being. We are so good at listening to people. It is time we stop and listen to God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And the destiny has for us. Praise the Lord. Yes. So my past can be interpreted. Some people can love it, some people can hate it. It doesn't matter because it is gone. You may interpret my history the way you want. I don't care because I know my God. And I know that my God has my future in his hands. Yes. And I know my God will not blame me for the mistakes I made in the past if I repent now and change my life now and say my Redeemer and my Savior, fill me with your power, fill me with your spirit. I want my future to be different from my past. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Don't we have a wonderful God? Yes. Hallelujah. Oh. If Jesus came today, at this very moment, at this season, your destiny would be determined not by your past, but by your present. Yes. By your relationship with Jesus Christ now, this moment, at this time. Amen. How is your relationship with Jesus Christ now? If you are to die today, what is your present relationship with Jesus Christ today, now? That's what the Lord will ask. And that will determine whether you are received in glory or whether you go to hell. This moment, Joshua said that that I and my house. This moment, we I have decided we shall serve the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, praise God. So I want you, I want to encourage you today, as you think about Gilgal, this is of Gilgal. Seek after God. Seek after his face. I know we live in an age of instant messengers and and Facebook, and Twitter, and social media, and everybody's in, in, in a hurry, and, and texting. So many people spend more time in Facebook than they spend in God's book. It is time we started making the right choices and the right decisions for our God. God will take you through a process. He will take you through Gilgal. And once you move out of Gilgal, then you go to move you to the next season, he'll move you to Bethel. Now Bethel is different from Gilgal. It was in Bethel that Jacob built an altar there and called it El Bethel because God appeared to him. When he fled from his brother Esau, it was at Bethel Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Again, at the birth of God, renewed his covenant with Jacob, the Abrahamic covenant was told afresh and in a new way. In Genesis chapter 28 and verse number 10, Jacob saw a vision in which he saw a very long ladder at Bethel stretching from earth to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. God spoke to him, saying, Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this place. When Jacob awoke, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. Let me say that again. When he woke up, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you God's people. Uh, right here in this church, uh, we, we, we are in a place where truly God is in this place. And whether you know it or not, and, and I'm hoping everybody knows that God is in this place. 
You know you have seen lives transformed. You've seen folks healed. You've seen people delivered. You've seen marriages restored. Sure that the Lord is in this place. The glory and the presence of the Lord is in this sanctuary. Because there are men and women. And this church is under the anointing and the leadership of a mighty servant of God who is very humble, seeks after God. I have always been blessed that uh, Bishop Kimani, whenever I come, I learn a lot from you about leadership. Releasing people to ministry. I just see everybody here participating in the ministry. It is not a one-man show. There is an anointing in this place. I see people laying their hands on, you know, on people. And each person is anointed because there is power in this sanctuary. Hallelujah. Because men and women of God seek God and release that anointing upon this church. So, we need to agree with Jacob that surely the Lord is in this place. And this is Bethel. So he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is a gate to heaven. So, he consecrated the place by laying a stone and a pillar. And he took anointing oil and poured it upon the stone. And here, for the first time, we see in the Bible, Jacob promised that day, to give 10% of all that he will ever receive or make as a tithe unto the law. There is an interesting symbolic uh, teaching here at Bethel. This is season of, of Bethel. God is getting ready to move Elisha into this season of blessing, a double portion. But before he can get to a place where he receives a double portion, he has to go through Bethel. At the Bethel, you see, we are learning that Jacob was in prayers and, and, and the windows of heaven were open and he was in intercession. And one of the things he learned at this season it is that he consecrated himself to God and the place where he was and he makes a commitment. God, you have renewed your promise to me. And now I promise that 10% of everything I will ever receive or make, I will give it to you. I'll pay a tithe. Let me tell you, the one thing that really hinders the financial blessings of God in our lives, it is when we do not pay our tithe faithfully to the church. It is part of it. You cannot get to Jordan until you go through Gilgal and you go through Bethel and at Bethel you promise that you will give to God 10% of everything that he gives you. Because God has promised as part of his blessings, to rebuke the devourer, to cast the enemy, to fight on your behalf. And so, before God can fight on your behalf, you have to meet a condition. And the condition, you have to be faithful in your giving. You have to pay your tithes into the house of God. That's what Jacob did. That's what happens in Bethel. It is a place of faithfulness. Renewing your promise to God. Bethel means house of God. So it's very interesting if you look at the meaning of the word Bethel and the fact that he is instituting the principle of giving tithe, it means that when you come into the house of God, it is expected if you're in the house of God, you have to give tithes unto the Lord as part of the ongoing process of receiving God's blessings upon your life. It means house of God. So number one, Bethel is a place of searching God through prayer and intercession. Number two, it is a place where we truly get a revelation of our creator. We cannot see the creation until we see the creator. We cannot minister to the creation until we first minister to the creator. We have to have a revelation of the creator before we can have a revelation of the creation. Are you with me? Hallelujah. So we gotta go through this season. As I said, we are created in his, in his image. In him we see ourselves. So we have to know him so that we can know ourselves. The more we know him, the more we know ourselves. 
because we are made in his image. Number three, it is that Bethel I get to heaven that the house of God, the house of prayer, that we receive a vision, a dream, a direction from God for our life. You cannot live your life aimlessly. You have to have a dream. And may I say, a bold dream for your future. A bold vision. Your vision has to be audacious and strong, but also be aware. When God gives you a vision, you've been praying, you, you are in this season of Bethel, and, and, and you've been seeking the Lord, you've been interceding, and, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and, and keep your bold vision, and a dream for your life, and you start with the boldness and audacity to walk in it. Satan will make sure. He, receives, he, he releases every demon in hell to stop him. The devil specializes in making sure that the dreams and the visions of God's people are aborted even before they are bad. But the devil is a liar. Amen. The devil is a liar, church. Amen. He may try to destroy your vision, he may try to destroy your dream even before it is bad, but God will make sure your dream will survive. Amen. Yeah, the devil will fight you, he will try to kill that or derail that vision, but your dream is coming from God. Yeah. And the, the answer to your prayers are just on the way to be manifested. So stay faithful, stay with it, just remain focused. Don't allow the devil to shake you. Don't let the devil sift you. You know, Jesus said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But, but he said to Peter, before you, you reach that point where I can build my church on this revelation, the devil has prayed to shake you. The devil has prayed to sift you. The devil has sought to move you around, to tempt you, to try you, to steal your dream and steal your vision. But Jesus said, Peter, I have prayed for you. Amen. It doesn't matter that the devil has been praying for you to shake you, to sift you, to steal your dream, steal your marriage, steal your children. Put upon them that spirit of alcoholism. I say the devil is a liar. I praise God that today Jesus is on the throne. He is your intercessor before God. He is praying for you. He's praying for you in the morning. He's praying for you in the afternoon. He's praying for you in the evening. He, does, he never goes to sleep. He's praying for you 24 hours a day so that your vision may not fail, so that your life may not fail, so that your marriage may not fail, so that your children may not fail, so that your finances may not fail. He says, I am praying for you. Amen. Hey, Amen. who would you rather pray for? You? The devil or Jesus? He that is on our side is greater than he that is on the other side. Oh, praise the Lord. So don't allow your vision and your dream to be stolen. Mm. So then, the third season is Jericho. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1. The children of Israel were told to march around the city of Jericho once for six days. Seven priests were to carry trumpets of ram, ram's horns, before the Ark of the Covenant. The seventh day, they were to march around the city of Jericho seven times. And the priests were to blow the trumpets on the seventh day and on the seventh walk around the city. When they the Lord told them that when they make, the whole congregation make a great sound with a trumpet and all the people give a loud shout, then immediately the walls of Jericho will come down. And that's what happened. Now, I want you to follow this. You see, Jericho is a place of victory. When you come to the season of Jericho in your life, this is, this is where you see your enemies defeated. Everybody that has been against you, all of a sudden God is going to change their hearts and they're going to become your friends. And in fact, those who sought to destroy you, <laughs> they will not want to support you. That's how the season of Jericho works. 
It is a place of shout. It is a place of victory. Eh? It is a place of overcoming. It is a place where every wall in your life, walls of poverty, is going to crumble. Walls of bondage crumbles here. It is a place of shout, a place of activation. And you notice God gave them specific instructions. He told them, walk around the city six times. But don't give a, a loud shout yet. Until you have walked around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, the priests and everyone that was carrying the trumpet, they shall shout very high and immediately the walls of Jericho you know, came down to the ground. So seven and Joshua the son of Nun said to the people, give a great shout for the wall has given you the city. You know there is something we need to learn here and, and I, I love this church. Once again, I know I said it because in this church people are not afraid Bishop Kimani to shout. Oh, hallelujah. You see, spiritually there is something about shouting. I, 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 I'm not ashamed of saying this, that we Pentecostals enjoy church more. <laughs> the Zulu Quill, that, that, that non Pentecostals, you imagine they go to church, they never shout. They are solemn and okay, but they are so dead that they need somebody to come and defrost them. The church is not a place where God's, God's assets should be frozen. <laughs> it should be a place where God's assets come to church, they find the fire, and the fire melts the ice, and they can't be. They become be. Thank you. They can be frozen. No wonder the church is not winning. We have too many churches with frozen assets. Waiting for the fire of God to come and defrost them so that they come alive. But I praise the Lord, you are a member of a church that was on fire. I assure you, in Deliverance Church, when you come here and you're frozen, you're not going to go home on, with ice. There is fire in this place. Oh, hallelujah. We give God the glory. <laughs> Amen. So, I, you know, I, I've always wondered, I want to say this quickly. Why did they, why did God tell them to walk around the wall of Jericho six times? You know, they could have walked only once and made a shout and the walls could have, but God is powerful. He's omnipotent. But he made them walk six times and the seventh time, seven times. And on the seventh time is when they were told to give a big shout and the walls of Jericho came down. I found out it was not because of God. God was telling them to walk, praying, and praying and seeking the law around the house of Jericho six times. It was building their faith. It was faith walk. Every time they went around, their faith was higher and higher and higher. That is why it's important, I believe, for us to repeat the word of God and to hear it again and again and again. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I believe that recitation, repetition, revisitation, increase, retention. I, I want you to get that then. And I want you to say this with the say after we say recitation, repetition, revisitation. Increase retention. So it is okay for us to repeat and recite and revisit the teachings of the principles of the Word of God. It increases retention. And in turn, retention enlarges our way of knowledge of the Word of God. So when we are in need, we can dig into that well in times of trouble. That was the purpose. So finally, they come to the final season, Jordan. Jordan is a place of impartation. This is a place of catching and receiving the mantle. It is a place where you cross over into God's destiny for you, where you start to
to experience the fulfillment of God's promises. This is the place where Jesus was baptized by John. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says, I did baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. The same shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with the fire. So it is a place where we get baptized with the fire. Jesus, when he was baptized, the Bible says he went up straight away out of the water and the law. The heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Jordan is a place of descending, where the Holy Spirit, in a very fresh way, descends upon us, where the mantle of Elijah descended upon Elijah, where a double portion of anointing came upon Elijah, where a double portion of the Spirit of the Father came upon Jesus Christ. This is where, when we come to the season of Jordan, it is where we receive a divine mantle in our lives. It is where a new anointing descends upon us. It is where we must die to self so that we can rise again unto the newness of our destiny. Remember, church, as I conclude, some things in life are received. Others are caught. <laughs> and I want to warn you, be careful what you receive and be careful what you catch. For example, you can catch a call from another person. They say that a person traveling around the world can infect people with a cold from Nairobi to New York to Japan, all within 48 hours. And I warn you as you seek the Lord, watch out who you hang around with. Be careful what they are throwing around. Is it something you want to catch? Elisha chose very wisely who to hang around with. He knew, I want to catch some anointing. I want to catch some mantle from heaven. I want to get some double portion for me. So I want to catch what this man has. So he hung around him. I ask you, my sister and my brother, today as I finish this message, who do you hang around with? Do they have what you want to catch? You see, if you hang around some people, whether you like it or not, it is a principle. You have, you're going to receive what they got. And you're going to catch what they got. So make sure you are receiving the right thing and you are catching the right thing. Hallelujah. So try to be around the right church, the right people, the right servants of God. Be around the right anointing. Amen. If you keep on listening, I, I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. In Atlanta, in Georgia where I am, there is a church uh, from people from West Africa. And those people have the de demonic spirit. Every Kenyan that joins that church, they get this weird anointing. They start talking funny. Eventually, they end up in a mental hospital. So I've been telling these sisters, don't go to that church if you don't want to go to mental hospital. And as soon as they leave that church, they get healed. Do not be in the wrong church. You're going to catch the wrong spirit and the wrong anointing. Hallelujah. Shall we stand up all over the room? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you could just you know, stretch your hands before the Lord, I just want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to give you glory, to give you praise. Thank you, Father, because of the teaching and the preaching of your word. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is in this place. We give you glory, we give you praise. I pray that, Father, that the word that has gone forth this morning that you will continue to water it, to anoint it, and to give your servants and the sins of God deeper revelation. Speak to them. Show them, O oh Lord, where they are. And meet them at the point of their greatest needs. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, you may keep your hands down for a moment. I just want to ask you, if you are here today, and as you were receiving the word of the law. The Spirit of the Lord is nudging you that maybe you do not know your season or the season where you are. And you, really, you, you need to receive the spirit of discernment. So, you, so, so that you are able to discern 
the seasons of God in your life and the will of God in your life. I just want to pray one prayer for you where you are. If you are the one, raise up your hand. If you need this direction, this ability, I want to pray for you and, and get ready to receive because you are raising that hand by faith. And when I pray, you're going to receive a new anointing that is going to help you in walking through different seasons in your life. Where on this road to receiving a double portion to where you're going to receive a double portion in your life. Let's go before the Lord Father in the name of Jesus. I lift up every saint, every believer that have lifted up their hands. They're seeking you, God, today. Say, as the word of the Lord has spoken to them this morning, that they need a spirit of discernment to be able to discern the seasons of God in their lives. Anoint them afresh right now. Give them that heavy and strong anointing now from your presence. Help them not walk in through these seasons to a place where they will receive a double portion of your blessings and your spirit. Give them an ability to discern the will of God so that, Father, they will be able to make the right choices and the right decisions for them and for their families and for their ministries and in their relationship with their Savior and their Redeemer. I pray that you touch each person, Father. Those who have made the wrong choices in the past, I pray that Jesus Christ, you will just wash them by your precious blood. Forgive them of those mistakes today and help them to start afresh in obedience of your word. Bless them, Father. Give them a breakthrough right now as they start this new journey in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So dear servants of God, I want you to receive that ability. Go ahead and receive it. Receive it. Receive it. It is yours. Get it now. Get it now. Now, 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 now. Go to war. Get it now. Get it now. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead and give the Lord another hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, indeed, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. So may God bless you.